All right, Shalom Aleichem, Boker Tov. Once again, it's Mikael back at you, as promised. Had to come outside and enjoy this beautiful day. Um, Want to go ahead and get right into this quick video log. Today is May 20th, and I've done some research and have uh, found a very interesting fact. Today actually marks the 1,689th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. This is the Nicaean Council's 1,689th anniversary. And the reason this is so important is because this council has completely transformed the face of the faith that was delivered to Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. And so what we have to understand is this. This is what was prophesied that would happen. And it is so profound because the beast that is responsible for bringing forth this transformation was prophesied in the seventh chapter of Daniel, 23rd to the 25th verse, about it would change times and law. But I want to read a couple of other passages to you and uh, let you know. This is no joke, people. This is no joke. So we have um, the book of Yehuda, only one chapter. This is what it says. This is Yehuda, the first verse through the fourth verse. Yehuda, a servant of Yahoshua Mashiach and brother of Yaakov to those who are called and set apart by Elohim the Father and preserved in Yahoshua Mashiach. Compassion and peace and love be increased to you beloved ones making all haste to write to you concerning our common deliverance so this is a common theme of deliverance to all gentile yahudi whatever you want to say okay i felt the necessity to write to you urging you to earnestly contend for the belief which was once for all delivered to the set apart ones for certain men have slipped in whose judgment was written about long ago, wicked ones perverting the favor of our Elohim for decency and denying our only master, yad heh wah -He, and our master, Yahoshua HaMashiach. There's some big old planes flying over my head, which is what you're hearing in the background. You may see it, uh, you won't see it. But it's, it's behind these trees, just flying overhead, right by the, um, downtown airport in Kansas City up at this park here for lunch but I wanted to do this okay because this is what has come into the fold okay um, this is also what Shaul wrote about in the book of Acts he says this this is Acts 20 verses 28 and or through 30 it says therefore take heed to yourselves and to the flock among the set apart spirit, among which the set apart spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the assembly of Elohim, which he has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among you, yourselves, men shall arise, speaking distorted teachings to draw away the taught ones after themselves. Now, this is so profound because Shaul was in. Melitus, which is an, uh, an assembly, um, no, from Melitus, Melitus, he sent to Ephesus and he called for the assemblers, the elders of the assembly. So he's in Ephesus. He's in a Roman um, little um, place called Ephesus. Now, the Nicene Creed, what I want to do is a couple things. I want to first read to you what the Nicene Creed is, okay? This is what the Nicene Creed states. It says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and, and, and invisible. That is true. Okay, the nature of deception is you can't just sell a whole lie. You have to sell it in portions. He says this, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, um, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. There's truth and lies in that statement there. 
For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. Whether or not she's a virgin is another matter, okay? For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now, this is the apostolic creed mingled with lies, with and truth, mingled with lies and truth. There is a profession that uh, Pope Francis, a.k.a. Jorge Mario Bergoglio, has recently stated in that the only true believers are a part of the Catholic Church. Okay, Of course, he uses the word Christian, which again, I completely separate myself from personally. I am not a Christian. I was raised Christian, but after my research, I found the erroneous nature of Christianity to be completely false. Um, and have rejected it in its totality, okay? But there were some things that took place that I have in some of these documents here before you from the World Wide Web um, that the Nicene Council uh, established. Um, pretty much three most important things. One, that the Catholic Church was supreme over all. Two, the Trinity and the divinity of Jesus, which is two and three, and also the separation of Pesach or Easter from um, the calendar Yah gave Israel. But to the first and foremost, let's get some background into this Nicene Council, okay? Let's read some things, okay? Um, let's make clear and understand, one, the person who convened it on this May 20th of the year 325, that Constantine, he was a pagan emperor period idolatrous who worshiped many gods chief being apollo and mithras um, and zeus uh, among many of the other patron gods that they worshiped but he was not concerned with religious truth but about the unity of his empire so you can kind of relate this to abraham lincoln and the matter of the slaves it wasn't really about slavery as the reason why he um disbanded the institution but it is about preserving the union okay so he was concerned about the unity of his empire he wanted the great rift that existed between the extremely influential alexandria which was the seat of the western powers of faith and the eastern portion of christianity which where um was seated um don't exactly know what that was but the eastern influence was where the true understanding of the faith was found but after 70 again, this became completely a European Western expression. And he wanted this healed though. He wanted the rift between East and West healed. He detested the Torah. He detested the Israelites, okay? Make this clear. You can read this in a book called When Jesus Became God um, on page 75 and also The Rise of Christianity on page 499. And of course, he also detested the mighty one of Judaism and the community that first served the Father in Mashiach. He called a council of the bishops of the church to work out a solution that would benefit his empire. So they met early in the summer of 325 with over 300 bishops of the church present. The emperor presided over this particular matter, but he provided a proxy host whose name was Bishop Hosius over the council and paid its expenses, okay? They discussed um, matters that related to what the three topics I talked about, um, the, the supremacy of the Catholic Church, the um, nature of the Messiah, and the Trinity, as well as the separation of Easter from the calendar that Yah had given. And this was a purely politically inspired event, okay? Um, let's see. There was a controversy that was present, which is what caused this rift to take place. They called it the Arian controversy. Arius was a bishop from Alexandria who stated 
with the early believers in Messiah that Yahushua was not God, okay? He was fully human, okay? However, upon his resurrection, they understood he inherited that which the Father had given him. But pretty much with this Hellenist influence, they compromised many of the most basic tenets of the faith, which served to alienate Christianity from its origins, from its Israelite roots and origins. In other words, it was the foundation for the creation of a new religion, one never intended by the Father, nor was not taught, nor was taught by Yahushua. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we examine this matter and the emergence of Constantine through the Council of Nicaea and the ramifications, you will see the drastic effects that the faith enunciated at Nicaea had on the future development of the church, which are present even to this day. Throughout all denominations, whether, whether Catholic or whether Protestant, this particular council, which is the first ecumenical council, the first ecumenical council, ecumenical means the, the gathering of all different faith expressions, okay? Under one roof, took place right there. Okay, so we have to look at this matter um, and understand I'm just kind of shifting through some papers and kind of putting this together. Up until the first council of Nicaea, the Roman aristocracy primarily worshipped two Greek gods, Apollo and Zeus, but the great bulk of common people idolized either Julius Caesar or Mithras. This was the common folks, okay? The elite worshipped Apollo or Zeus, but the common folks worshipped Caesar or Mithras. This is apotheosis. This is a purely Luciferian teaching that man shall become gods. He shall be gods. Apotheosis, which is the transformation of man into God. Okay. Julius Caesar was held as God made manifest in the universal savior of human life. His successor, Augustus, was called the ancestral God and Savior of the whole human race. Okay, you can read this from Man and His Gods by Homer Smith, as well as some other books as well. Emperor Nero, quite similar, who was one of the most fierce persecutors of the assembly of Israel in the diaspora, particularly in Rome was also immortalized on his coins as the savior of mankind, okay? Constantine's intention at Nicaea was to create an entirely new god for his empire who would unite all religious factions under one deity. Uh, pretty much there were 53 gods on the table for discussion. For one year and five months, the balloting lasted. At the end of this time, Constantine returned to the gathering to discover the presbyters has not, had not agreed on a new deity, but had balloted down to a short list of five prospects. It was Caesar, Krishna, Mithra, Horus, and Zeus. You can read this in the Historia Ecclesiastica of Eusebius in the year 325. Constantine was the ruling spirit at Nicaea, and he ultimately decided upon the new god for them. To involve the British factions, the Western Assembly, this is what he did. To involve the British factions, he ruled that the name of the Druid god Hesus, Hesus, Jesus, Jesus. This is something that you can find E S U S, Esus, or Jesus, be joined with the Eastern savior god Krishna, which is Sanskrit for Christ, be taken, and it was a majority show of hands. I'm sorry, be um. They were merged with the Eastern savior god Krishna, and thus Jesus Krishna would be the official name of the new Roman God. A vote was taken and it was a majority show of hands, 161 votes to 157, that both divinities become one God. So following long-standing heathen custom, Constantine used the official gathering and the Roman apotheosis decree, the transformation of man into God, to legally deify two deities as one and did so by democratic consent. A new God was proclaimed and officially ratified by Constantine, which is Acta Concilia Nicena 1618. This purely political act of deification effectively and legally placed Jesus and Krishna among the Roman gods as one indivisible composite. Now, the Christians turned this true name of the Messiah, which is Yahushua, who, if you look at the record books, all authorities agree was a righteous man. He was a Torah observant individual, okay? He was a Zadik, in other words, a righteous man, whose name also gives esteem to the Father and to the name of a detestable pagan deity called Jesus. Then how much more could they twist this man's teachings to say that he taught against the Father's laws? But one of the most cherished ideas 
of the pagans, which was absorbed by these Hellenist Christians. Okay, Christianity was not a faith that the Messiah practiced, nor did his disciples or even the Apostle Paul. Okay, Shaul, Rav Shaul, they did not practice such, but it was that of the Trinity of God. So this is where the Trinitarian Athanasian Creed comes into it. The Savior whom the entire Christian world worships at this time is nothing more than the continuation of the pagan tree, Trinity. The fact that this doctrine did not officially become formulated until centuries after Yahushua's death attests to the fact that this doctrine does not come from Yah's laws nor his from the mouth of his prophets. The New Bible Dictionary, the second edition by J.D. Douglas on page 1221, admits the doctrine of the Trinity does not come from the scriptures but from philosophy influenced by paganism. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible. This is quoting from that particular section of the scripture of the uh, Bible Dictionary. The word Trinity is not found in the Bible, and though used by Tertullian in the last decade of the second century, it did not find a place formally in the theology of the church until the fourth century. Okay, this is in the 300s, 325 Nicene Council. It, however, is the distinctive and all comprehensive doctrine of the Christian faith. It has become known as what Christianity is defined by this Trinitarian erroneous profession of faith. It makes three affirmations that there is but one God, that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is each God, and that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is a distinct person, each. Okay? In this form, it has become the faith of the church since it received its first full form formulation at the hands of Tertullian, Athanasius, and Augustine. The express profession of Israel is this Shema Israel. Yahuwah Eloheinu, Yahuwah Echad, Yah is one. This is in complete antith antithetical um, relationship to what this states. Continuing, the Encyclopedia of Britannica, Micropedia Volume 11, page 928, gives us the following facts about the Trinity. Trinity in Christian doctrine, the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three persons in one Godhead. Neither the word Trinity nor the explicit doctrine appear in the Old in the New Testament, nor did the Messiah and his followers intend to contradict the Shema in the Old Testament. And I just read the Shema in Hebrew. Hear, O Israel, Yah is our mighty one, Yah is one. The doctrine developed gradually over several centuries and through many controversies. Also, the Abingdon Dictionary of Living Religions on page 767 tells us the Trinity is the dogma formulated authoritatively in the 4th century church councils that Christians worship one God in three persons and one substance. So under the pressure to explain to a hostile Roman world how Christians continued themselves, counted themselves as monotheists, Christian apologists combined Johnanine and Stoic Platonic understanding of the term Logos in order to maintain that the Son was both God's own self-expression and a being distinct with him. Now, interesting to note, the term Logos was defined by the Christians according to the interpretations of pagan-influenced philosophers in order to promote a false pagan god savior. In the Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 7, page 449, 449, we read the following. The Greek word reason or plan, Logos, okay? Plural, Logi. In Greek philosophy and theology, the divine reason implicit in the cosmos, ordering it and giving it form and meaning. Through the concept defined by the term Logos, though the concept defined by the term Logos is found in Greek, Indian, Egyptian, and Persian philosophical and theological statements, it became particularly significant in Christian writings and doctrines to describe or define the role of Jesus Christ as the principle of God active in the creation and the continuation structuring of the cosmos and in revealing the divine plan of salvation to man. It thus underlines the basic Christian doctrine of the pre-existence of Jesus. The identification of Jesus with the Logos was further developed in the early church, but more on the basis of Greek philosophical ideas than on Old Testament motifs. So this is vain reasonings and empty philosophies, okay, which have deceived the entire world into believing this false doctrine. Now, um, as far as this council is concerned as well, Arians was a man who again wanted to get the people to understand that this term that they used of one substance was not coherent or actually um, correct.
Arius, which is what the Arian controversy is all about. Who said that Jesus was not God, although he could be called divine. He was made by the Father. And so there was a time when he did not exist. He was made out of nothing and is therefore of an entirely different substance or essence from that of the Father. He must not be worshipped as the one true mighty one. Apparently, Arius also believed that in his heavenly pre-existence, the Messiah had been the highest of angels. But this was not an invention of Arius. It was a much earlier Christian tradition which Arius was upholding. Okay, this is from a short history of Christian doctrine. Okay, from um, Bernard Los, Fortress Press in 85. Traditional interpretation has held that this angel was pre-incarnate, was a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Messiah as the Father's messenger servant. Now, um, the vast majority of those bishops of the Council of Nicaea were led by the Eusebius of Caesarea. These were semi-Arians. They strongly agreed with the Arians that the Messiah was not God and must not be worshipped as God. They believed, however, or also that the Messiah did not always exist. They basically said the Father generated the Messiah from a substance similar to his own. He is not equal to the Father, but is subordinate to him, even though he is above all the rest of creation. He must not be worshipped as the one true God. And this is when you can read in Scripture various times Messiah himself saying that the Father is greater than he is. Okay, so that is two of the things there, the nature and that there. But let's go ahead and, and, and close this out. Because I don't want to get into too much depth. I just want to give a brief overview of this. And you can look it up for yourself. The separation of Easter's computation from the Israelite calendar. The Feast of Easter is linked to the Jewish Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. As Christians believe that the Christian that the crucifixion and resurrection of the Messiah occurred at the time of those observances. As early as Pope Sixtus, which was from 115 to 124, some Christians had set Easter to a Sunday in the lunar, lunar month of Nisan, or Abib, which is typically around April. To determine which lunar month was to be designated as Nisan, Christians relied on the Jewish community, but they rejected everything else. By the later by the latter third century, some Christians began to express dissatisfaction with what they took to be the disorderly state of the Israelite calendar. They argued that the contemporary Jews were identifying the wrong lunar months as the month of Nisan, choosing a month whose 14th day fell before the spring equinox. Christians, these thinkers argued, should abandon the custom of relying on Jewish information and instead do their own computations to determine which month should be styled Nisan. Again, the equinox is dealing with the sun. They were sun worshipers and they have to understand, they you know, they wanted to understand things according to the flow of the sun as opposed to the state of the moon, okay? The Father tells us to recognize the signs of the month and the times of the month by the moon, but these were solar worshipers. We are lunar observers and worshipers of the one true Elohim. Make a clear distinction. Um, they believe they also should always occur and locate this festival after the equinox. They justified this break with tradition by arguing that it was in fact the contemporary quote-unquote Jewish calendar that had broken with tradition by ignoring the equinox and that in the former times the 14th of Nisan had never preceded the equinox era. Others felt that the customary practice of reliance on the Jewish calendar should continue even if, even if the Jewish computations were in error from a Christian point of view. The controversy between those who argue for independent computations and those who argue for continued reliance on the Jewish calendar was formally resolved by the Council of Nicaea, which endorsed the independent procedure that had been in use for some time at Rome and Alexandria. Easter was henceforward to be a Sunday in a lunar month chosen according to Christian criteria, in effect a Christian Nisan, not in the month of Nisan as defined by Israel. Those who argued for continued reliance on the Jewish calendar, called the Proto-Paschites from the Paschal or the Passover or Pesach, by later historians were argued to come around to the majority position. That they did not all immediately do is so is revealed by the existence of sermons, canons, and tracts written against the Proto-Paschite practice in the later 4th century. These two rules, independence of the Jewish calendar and worldwide uniformity, were the only rules for Easter explicitly laid down by the council. No details for the computation were specified. These were worked out in practice, a process that took centuries and generated a number of controversies. In particular, the council did not decree that Easter must fall on Sunday. This was already the practice almost everywhere in Christian world, not in the Hebrew world, okay? 
nor did the council decree that Easter must coincide with Nisan 14, the first day of unleavened bread, now commonly called Passover in the Hebrew calendar. By endorsing the move to independent computations, the council had separated the Easter computation from all dependents, positive or negative, on the Jewish calendar. The Zonoras Provisio, the claim that Easter must always follow Nisan 14 in the Hebrew calendar, was not formulated until after some centuries. By that time, the accumulation of errors in the Julian solar and lunar calendars had made it the de facto state of affairs that Julian Easter always followed Hebrew Nisan 14. So here you can clearly see that these Gentiles, these Hellenists, the fourth beast is responsible for transforming this matter and bringing into the assembly these heretical teachings, these false doctrines that have now permeated and perforated what is known as Christianity and defined what is known as Christianity. Again, the Messiah was never a Christian, nor were his disciples, nor was the apostle Paul or the first believers. They were called Nazareans, they were also called Ebionites, but most importantly, they were called the followers of the way, okay? That is what we have to understand as it relates to this very peculiar anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. So with that, I pray that these words inspire, again, edify, educate, enlighten, and challenge you to go do some research on this because this is a very important matter as relates to getting back to the common deliverance once for all delivered to all men okay this is what this comes down to do the research do the knowledge may the most high bless you and keep you may the most high cause his countenance to shine upon you be kind to you may the most high lift up his face unto you and give you peace shalom and one love y'all